So we got some real interesting news here. Uh, Zosha Ming's return to the ring against Nathan Santana has actually drawn 36.5 million viewers, according to the reports, between uh, Chinese television and the live stream that they had on the internet. And that's on top of the 12,000 plus fans who were actually in the arena to see him fight live. And this is really interesting because a lot of people initially, like myself included to a certain degree, um, were wondering exactly why Zhou Ming was able to, you know, command the the high purses that he was able to to get. If I remember right, I, th I believe his his pro debut, he made 350,000. Uh, then he made like half a million. Then against, um, I'm not wrong, wrong. He was making over 750 grand, you know, which is pretty crazy for not just um, a flyweight fighter, but uh, a guy that's only a few fights into his pro career. Although you have to also look at the fact that he's making a hell of a lot of money from Leaning, Leaning Athletics, which is pretty much like the Nike of China. Um, you know, he's got a huge endorsement deal with them. He has endorsements deals with uh, with Beats headphones over in China. And then he's all, he pretty much most of his adult life as an amateur, even though he was a quote unquote amateur, he was basically getting stipends from the, from the government. You know, he was China's most popular athlete behind Yao Ming, back when Yao Ming was in his prime and when Zhou Ximing only had a bronze medal from the 2004 Olympics. Of course, he went on to win gold in both 2008 and 2012, which, you know, just it took his fame to entirely new heights in China. So, you know, he's basically the the athlete. He's the athlete du jour there. He pretty much does... He, he's like what like Kung Fu cinema is, but in real life. Like it's like they, it's never been like that before, where they have you know a superstar in real life who's competing against the rest of the world, and he's showing off you know the the might of China essentially is is you know he's he's a symbolic representation to a certain degree. So I mean that the the thing that I find very positive about it is the fact that I think if they can get him mixed up with uh, some of the other top either flyweights or light flyweights should he choose to move back down to his uh to the weight that he fought at as an amateur for all those years you know I'm still I'm certain he can still make the weight I remember one of his fights he was only 115 on fight night so I mean if you're gaining three pounds overnight you know that's pretty much I mean he, who knows if he was even wearing clothes or uh for the second weigh-in or whatever you know he's 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 basically on weight all the time you know he's a, he's not a big guy um, that, and I think actually that kind of hurt him against I'm not run wrong because I'm not run wrong looks like the type of dude like you just tell by his build and by the difference between when he weighed in and when he was in the fight he was a stronger physical you know specimen essentially than than Shiming and that you know that essentially helped him in being able to kind of muscle him around and keep Shiming from just overwhelming him with the speed and the uh, the explosiveness. But Shiming, if he was able to fight somebody like uh, Ryoichi Taguchi be a China versus Japan rivalry at 108. That would be a huge fight uh, for the WBA title. And if he were to fight for the WBA regular title against Kazuto Yoka from Japan, that would be probably that that would probably be the biggest purse in like sub bantamweight history. That would be even bigger probably than the Carbajal versus Chiquita Gonzalez fights. Michael Carbajal versus Humberto Chiquita Gonzalez where they made they both made I believe over a million dollars for both the first and the second fights. Uh and you know, they 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 made gangbusters, man. Even the third fight they made a hell of a lot of money. Not quite as much. Um as well, I'm not you know, I'm not even sure if they both made seven figures for the third fight. I think they might have actually though. Uh, but, you know, they, they were the two guys that got paid crazy, crazy high. A lot of it had to do, of course, with the fact that Carbajal had been an Olympic, uh, I believe, silver medalist for the United States. So he had a lot of hype coming out of coming out of uh, his Olympics with uh, representing the United States and everything. And he had a big hometown crowd in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, similar to the way Ximing, I mean, he pretty much has a hometown crowd anywhere and everywhere in the whole country of China, because originally his fights were in Macau, and now in Shang he's in Shanghai, he's fighting out of Shanghai, and actually I think in Shanghai, it seemed like the crowd was a bit more raucous than they had been in Macau, I'm guessing probably because with Shanghai, it's, um, there's more of the, the regular type crowd as opposed to Macau, it's mostly high rollers, so they don't necessarily have that same draw to the sport as, uh, as the the more average or poor folks. So, I mean, I think this is good news. I'd love to see him mix it up with somebody like an Ioka or a Taguchi, maybe Akira Yagashi. That would be an action fight, all-action fight. Um, 
I'm sure they're probably going to keep him away from Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez and Juan Francisco Estrada. Uh, but, I mean, if he was to fight, because, I mean, the thing is, he's most likely losing to those guys and losing badly. Uh, but, I mean, if they could get him against any of these other guys, who knows, maybe even a Brian Valoria. I think Brian Valoria might be a little bit dangerous for him because of the punching power. But Valoria isn't necessarily known for his gas tank or his work rate. So, Shaming might, might stand a, a fair shot there. Um, and that would be an, another all-action fight. But, uh, yeah, Shaming is fun to watch. Um, you know, of course, he's not the elite of the elite at flyweight or light flyweight. Uh, but I think he could definitely be, he's basically like B-tier. He's second-tier level at these weights. Uh, but his his uh, ability to draw fans, draw ratings, and draw big money is where his real worth to these divisions comes into play. And especially because Gonzalez and Estrada most, like will, most likely will be moving up in the near future to fight the likes of uh, Nagi Inoue and... Carlos Cuadras and Kohei Kono at 115. Um, if Shaming were to stay at 112 or move down to 108, I think that would help keep a lot of the money down at the lower weights as a cl- as opposed to taking the money up to 115 and 118 and and so on. And you know, 122 already has pretty pretty heavy money considering you know Frampton, Quig, Regan Dow, uh, Donaire, Seha. I mean, those guys it's, those guys don't need any more help <laughs> drawing crazy cash to to that division. So it'd be good to see him uh, keep it, keep it in the in the weight classes between like 108, 112, and keep everybody there, you know, paid and keep keep these fighters active and being able to to fight for purses that they really deserve. You know, a lot of these fights are great action fights, and these guys really deserve to be a bit better paid. I mean, some of them they they make good money. I'm not trying to say that they're in the poorhouse there, but there there are certain guys that draw better than others, you know, depending on how big they are, name in their hometown or their home country. You know, specifically like Japan, the fighters from Japan and Thailand tend to get paid pretty well, especially if they consistently win, especially in Japan, because you know Japan has a, has a pretty booming economy as far as combat sports go. Uh, you know, they the people people love boxing over there, so guys over there definitely ain't starving. Especially somebody like Kazuto Yoka, the one that I mentioned in particular. Kazuto Yoka is Japan's number one star. I mean, he drives around a Lamborghini Gallardo as his uh, daily driver, you know, and that's just one of his cars. You know, he's he's definitely well paid and he only has what, a little over a dozen fights. So that, that should tell you something right there. But, I mean, that's all for this one. Hopefully what I, what I mentioned comes to pass. We get Shming mixing it up with some of these other guys. Getting, getting guys like uh, Taguchi, Yoka, maybe like maybe even giving some of the uh, the guys that aren't necessarily big names a chance too. Maybe get in somebody like a um, like a Moises Fuentes would be a good would be an excellent fight. Uh, you know, Fuentes could definitely benefit big time from that. Or Javier Mendoza would be another good one. Uh, Alberto Rossell would be a, a good one. Former champion Rossell. Uh, Fuentes, of course, a former champion, and uh, so is uh, Raul Garcia, another former champion. There's a lot of there's a lot of guys at 108 in particular that are killers. You know, they're they're high level, high level fighters that could potentially knock off any of the champions at 108. 108 is definitely an uh, an open division in so far as there is not necessarily one clear guy where it's like you would favor him over everybody else in the division. The closest to that would probably be Dani Nietes of the Philippines, but even him, he, even he has uh, shown some weaknesses in the past, and he almost uh, he almost dropped the decision in his first fight against Moises Fuentes. But I'm going off topic now. Um, Shaming's a big draw. I hope uh, he continues to bring the big ratings, and anybody that happens to possibly beat him, hope they uh, get that torch of ratings passed to them too. But that's it for this one. I'm out.